welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. Let's get into the word of God. Are you ready? Yes? Thank you. Front row. Love you. Come on, get excited. All right. Why? Here's why. Here's why. Because you're not getting excited for me. You're getting excited for God. You're getting excited to hear from the word of God. He's going to give you something. I'm just going to talk, but only the Holy Spirit can actually communicate it to your heart. Only the Holy Spirit can make it drop from your head into your spirit. Only he can do that. So we want to get him here, regardless of my height, color, no matter who preaches, a gender. We just want them to communicate the word of God. That's always been what we desire. So let's do that. Is that okay? Would you stand with me? And let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we ask you to visit us tonight. As a matter of fact, Lord, you're here already. Holy Spirit, we just ask you that you will arrest our minds and our hearts this very hour, that you will take over this very moment. Father, I ask that you would communicate the truth of God to us. Lord, the ground is the issue, never the seed. The seed is your word, and it is perfect. So I ask that tonight our hearts be good ground, Lord God, that we may receive the seed and we multiply a hundredfold in our life this very hour. So I pray for that in this moment in the name of Jesus. Lord, As you bless us here at The Rock, we're so grateful for that. We ask that you would bless other churches in the Inland Empire and around the world. We do not consider ourselves better better than them. We always say it because we believe it. We are co-workers, co-laborers with them, advancing one kingdom, and that is yours. Bless them today, Lord God. Strengthen the pastors to communicate the true word of God this very hour. In Jesus' name, we all say Amen. amen. You may be seated. Really, tonight, I, I, wanna, I want us to connect with an area of our own life. And um, many times a challenge, most of you guys are going through uh, things in your life. But I, I want to bring you to a point in a story in the Word of God of, about a person that I want you to see yourself in this story. But before we go there, I just want to tell you something that happened to me. A while back, I was going to a gym. Obviously, I need to get back to the gym, but that's neither here nor there. Um, it's a different topic. Don't go there. What? Um, so, so I go to this gym, right? Like at every gym, they have a rack of uh, dumbbells, right? And if you know what dumbbells, those little weight that you lift. So there's one rack that goes from like the two and a half pounders for aerobics all the way up to like 25. And then there's another rack that goes from like 30 all the way to like 90 or 100 pounds. So I come into the gym. I'm thinking, man, that thing just, that's going to gather dust. I mean, who's going to lift that, right? So that's, you know, I go, and I go another day to, to exercise, and, you know, I'm in about 25 range, you know, I'm all, you know, sweating. This one guy walks in, and this guy just, it didn't look natural. I mean, this guy was just huge everywhere. I mean, he was enormous. He walks in, and uh, when he walks in, he goes up to the 90-pound or 100-pound dumbbells, man, he grabs those things, sits, puts on his iPod, and then looks at me and goes like that. And I'm thinking, what? What does he want? I mean, I've... I can barely do it with two hands, let alone, I mean, I, I thought this guy's crazy. So he wants me to spot him on his elbows so he doesn't drop it. So, I mean, this guy picks up this thing, just goes out, rah, rah, and I'm there. I'm doing nothing. I'm, I'm just standing there. I'm just like, all right, man, good. I mean, this is awesome. Uh, this guy has crazy big biceps, just absolutely strong, just massive. And he was just going at it and just drops them. You, just, you know, you throw them on the floor because if you don't throw them, you don't look bad. I mean, you have to rah, drop them, even if you can put them down. Uh, <laughs> But, but so he throws them on the floor, you know, it looks all, all buff. And I thought to myself, man, this guy's this guy enormous. I mean, what, what can humanly possible stop him? And many times, many times, what came to mind when I was preparing today is God invites us in that same way. God says to you and said, hey, I know you can't lift the 100-pound dumbbell, but I want you to come up here and spot me because I want to involve you in what I'm about to do that is beyond your capacity, is beyond what you have to do, but I want you to know that I want you to be involved. And for all of us, that is a, a strong calling that God is asking us to be involved in this thing. He is inviting us to say, hey, just spot me. Just be part of what I'm about to do. But for us to get to that level, we're going to go through some testings of where we're at. How strong are you? How strong are you? It's so important for us to determine that in our own life, determine that and figure out where are we in life? How strong are we? Because that's going to determine how far we can go, how much we can lift, 
what we can do, what we can withstand, that's all part of strength. And I'm not talking about physical strength. Put that aside. That was just an example for us to get to what God wants for us. But he wants us to know, to rate our own heart, our own mind, or where we're at in life. And there's only one way. There's only one way to find out um, how strong you are. There's going to be things in your life that test your strength. Are you with me? And we're going to talk about a little bit about that, looking at the life, an example of a king that... We've covered here before, but when I was studying, some things came up, and I loved it. Go to 2 Chronicles 32. 2 Chronicles 32, and just hold your place there. And uh, we'll read it in a little bit, not right now, but I want you to go there. 2 Chronicles in the Old Testament. 2 Chronicles 32. So when you get there, hold your place. We're going to stay there the rest of the night. We're not going to jump around a whole lot. And so here's Hezekiah. Very interesting man. He becomes king. Hezekiah becomes king at a very young age. What you need to know about Hezekiah is that Hezekiah was a a guy who was very interesting because his father before him, King Ahaz, was a really, really bad guy. When I'm talking about bad, he was he was bad guy. He um took down uh, all the things from the temple. He sold the gold that was separated or, or for, that was selected or put aside for the serving of God. He brought in other idols. He made people worship other idols, go after things that were evil. I mean, this guy was absolutely atrocious. He brought so much evil into Judah. Right now, the two kingdoms are divided. He brought so much uh, uh, evil in there. And then this kid comes along, Hezekiah, who when he became king, I believe says he was 24 years old. So he had seen everything his father did, everything, everything. So this is not new to him. He's absolutely living in a household where evil is going on. He's living in a household where people are not worshiping the true God. If, if we can put it that way, he really didn't know who the true God was, but he does something interesting. The day he becomes king... Says in the word of God, I believe in chapter 29, that Hezekiah did all the right things after God following his father, David. It doesn't say following his father, Ahaz. See, God is inviting you and I to be part of his life regardless of where you've come from. Many of us will say, Pastor, you have no idea I was born, uh, you know, I'm born and raised San Bernardino. I've seen crazy stuff in my neighborhood. You have no, my father, my parents aren't godly. I don't even know where my father is. My father's been in prison for years. I have brothers in, in jail. I've lived a very hard life. I've been sick in my body and I've been upset at God for X amount of years because I want to be whole. There's things in our life that somehow seem to test our level of strength. Are you with me? And Hezekiah was the same way. Hezekiah is here in his life thinking, man, Look, everything I've seen, yet he does something so interesting. He goes after God. And then Hezekiah starts bringing what, we, what you would call the Reformation to Judah. He said, forget this. He destroys everything his father did. He destroyed all the idols, kick them out. He brings back the Levites and the priests of the temple because they had been kicked out of the temple. He brings them back. He said, no, you're going to serve God. Tells the people, you have to bring the tithe. You have to give so that they can serve God 24-7, worship him. So bring what is needed for the temple. I mean, he absolutely brought reformation after all that was in order. Then he celebrated the Passover. He said, we have to remember how strong our God has been for us. The Passover was the establishment of the strength of God when they crossed from Egypt. And he said, let's celebrate the Passover. Let's remember the God we have, how strong he is on our behalf. And for all of us, if I can put it this way, Hezekiah became a born-again Christian. He became, uh, uh, he had a conversion. He had a transformation in his life. How about you? How about myself? Have we had that, com that conversion in our life? Have we challenged our own things in our lives from our past, from our families, and said, that's not going to be in my life. I want to establish the things of God in my own life. Are you with me? Are you uncomfortable? Good. <laughs> I just have two phrases for you. I probably won't be long tonight. Um, but I want to do a little bit at the end. Also, I want to give you time to have an encounter with God. But there's one thing I want you to remember. That testing, that testing, testing determines your strength. Testing determines your strength. If you're going through something right now in your life, don't run from it. That, that's the word of God right now. It's, if you're going through something in your life, don't run from it. Don't run. Because if you don't run, you're giving yourself a chance to determine how strong are you. 
You're trying to figure out where, where's my life? Where am I at with God? How are the things are doing? But here's what happens. It's so interesting because I know you've been through that before. Second Chronicles 32.1 says, Second Chronicles 32.1 says, After these deeds of faithfulness, let me translate it for you. After Hezekiah went to church twice a week, gave tithing, he was a good guy, he joined the worship team, his family wanted to kill him. Oh, oh, better yet, after Hezekiah was such a good guy, he became an SPT, his boss wanted to fire him. Hezekiah did everything right. I mean, what's wrong with Hezekiah? He took down everything that was evil. He came to God. He established everything. People were giving tithe. There was good order in, uh, in the temple. People were worshiping God, looking for the real God once again. Yet it said, after these deeds of faithfulness, these deeds, he did all the right things. Look at this. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered Judah, and he encamped against the fortified city. Oh, man. I did everything right, and now the biggest, baddest army in the known world comes after me. What's that all about? Have you ever wondered that? And then I, I like this word. You ready? says there, and he encamped. You know what that means? The problem never went away. That kind of hurts, huh? You kind of want it to go away. You want some, something to deflate the problem. You want the situation to go away. But unless you test it, you have no idea how strong you are. I remember in the 80s. Hopefully you remember if you're old enough. But remember that metal bar with a coil spring in the middle? Remember that? Where you would have to like bend it, right, to see? I remember, I mean, we were little punks in the neighborhood, and there was a guy who was older than us, probably 15, 16, and man, he, uh, he was working out with this thing. And so we're all, so that looks easy, right? When it's from far away, it looks so simple. So we're all giving it a shot. You know, we're all nothing. I mean, no, and have you ever put it between your legs and let it go? It, I mean, be honest. You got smacked in your jaw, many of you here today. But unless you tested it, you had no idea how strong you were. Unless you were in front of it, you couldn't figure out, can I really muscle that? Can I really do that in my own life? In the same way, you and I with God are doing the exact same thing. In our life, God brings a situation that may look different from afar, but when it's in front of you, he wants you to push through it. He wants you to muscle it until you're able to do it. Here's what's interesting. The more you tried it, eventually you figure out how to do it. Eventually you grew the strength to bend the bar. Are you with me? In the same capacity... God desires that for you. See, in Hezekiah, he did everything right. There, there's no way you read 29 through verse, chapter 29 through 32, the guy did nothing wrong. I mean, he was after God. He was doing everything right, and all of a sudden, something comes against him. Is that the reality for you today? I don't know. But if it is, I have good news for you. And the good news is that God is using it to figure out and work on you and your spiritual muscle and your life muscle so that you don't give up so easy so that you continue to go through. I want you to know that. I want you to know something that I've noticed in life, and the devil does this a lot. When the devil knows you're going to give up at a certain point, he will always attack you because you know you're going to give up there. But when he sees you push us through, he will leave you alone. He'll leave you alone. He'll move up to something else, but on that, he probably won't be bothered again. <laughs> that wasn't such good news, but... <laughs> I'm trying here, I'm trying. If you jump down to verse number seven, so interesting, it says that when that happened, then Hezekiah goes before the people and said, my goodness, listen, this is absolutely, uh, something is happening. People notice that the armies are there. Hezekiah's doing everything. And then he stands before the people to talk to them. And he says the following word. He says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismay. Let me tell you something. You never say that if you're really strong. Do you know that? You've never seen anybody really strong and said, don't be afraid. They don't need to be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid. So inside of them, they're dealing with a lot of fear. Because l Let me put it this way so you get a mental picture. It's like this front row, there's seven seats, and myself, we are Judah. We're Hezekiah and the army. And all of you guys, that's Assyria. Assyria. That's how big, I mean, the difference was enormous. This kingdom was huge. So... Imagine that. Seven guys are looking at maybe 800, 1,000, maybe a little more of you guys saying, well, hey, don't be afraid, man. We can take them. <laughs> I mean, they were, it was, they were afraid. They were afraid. 
That was the reality. So they said, do not be afraid, nor this may be for the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude. The Bible never exaggerates. All the multitude that is with him. For there are more with us than with him. And that's when they grabbed them and locked them up. No, just kidding. <laughs> I mean, you have to understand. I mean, the Bible is expressing it in a very interesting way. Can I put it to you this way? When your situation looks very, very difficult, you've got to tweak your mind to what God says about you. You cannot go along with your situation and repeat it. And I know I've done it. I've done it where I see the situation and I'm just dwelling in it and I'm just thinking about it. As a guy said, forget them. Don't look at them. Don't think about it. Remember that who is with us is far stronger. It's greater than anything you see in front of you. Anything you see in front of you. Verse number, number eight says, with his arm, with him is an arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God. With him is an arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and fight our battles. And it was, that's such an, an expression. That was an expression that drew me to work on this message. Because when I read it, I just imagined that guy. I mean, the image came to mind right away. Just one big arm with huge biceps. And that's what I thought. And here's Hezekiah. Here's what he's saying. Because sometimes the Bible writes in, in poetic terms. Hezekiah is saying, He's got an army, he's got money, he's got everything in the natural to do whatever he wants against us. But we have an advantage. We have the Lord, the Lord, our God. We have the Lord, our God. It is so important for us to have that in our hearts and in our spirit. Regardless of what you see on the exterior, regardless of the situation, regardless of the person's amount of money, influence, position, no matter how, no matter what, you have to count on God to do something on your behalf. Because if you lose that in your mind as a Christian, you're going to lose your war. You're going to lose your fight. You're going to lose your strength. You have to have it in your mind that God is going to do something in your behalf. doesn't matter if you don't have the right last name. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what neighborhood you come from. Doesn't matter. God wants to do something on your behalf. He wants to ink favor on your behalf. He wants to show you how strong He is. It is so important. Very important. I was in the country of South, South America and Peru. Um, I'm not sure if I ever shared that story here, but if I have, then just bear with me. Um, but we were there and we were in a mission trip one time. And so what happens is that we. We're there. We were there for a week. We were deep into the jungle uh, of Peru in a small town. And we went to pray for the mayor of the town. There had been a lot of fighting and, and guerrillas and stuff like that there. And so we went and prayed for the mayor. Bless him. Uh, my wife, uncle, had a word of prophecy for him. Really powerful moment. So he was excited. So he wrote a letter saying, hey, you guys are my guests. I'm going to give you the key of the town. We did a ceremony. Absolutely. I mean, just beautiful. It's a small town, but they have a lot of formalities. And so the, our day goes back. We go back to doing our, our night, evening evangelistic campaigns. Our week ends, and we go to the airport. When we go to the airport, the lady at the counter says, there's no plane for you guys. Uh, excuse me? I mean, we bought a ticket. We pay for it. There's no plane for us? She said, yeah, because in Lima, the capital, nobody bought a plane ticket, so we didn't want to fuel the plane to come get you guys, so you guys are on your own. I was like, uh, th that, it doesn't work like that, lady. I don't care what you do. Figure it out. You know, I'm the translator of the team also. So we're stuck in the jungle. There's about seven of us, and uh, there's a Peruvian guy, myself, and the rest of them are um, Americans. And so we're, we're just there. We're figuring it out. So we start talking and brainstorming. Then we, somebody decides, hey, man, it's time to pray. It's time to go to God and get the answer for the situation. So we're holding hands there in the airport, and we're praying. And a guy overhears our conversation, our prayer, and taps on the shoulder. My wife's uncle says, hey, what's going on? He said, well, here's what happened. We, we had a plane ticket, and uh, the plane decided not to show up. So now we have to travel 13, hour by, 13 hours by bus to get back to Lima. The danger of that is the gorillas that are there um, can catch you, steal everything from you. You might get killed. It, it's a rough area. So we didn't want to do that, obviously. Uh, and so we we're like, okay, uh, what are we going to do, you know? So he says, hey, I know that there's a plane for the Air Force that takes poor people to Lima. But we don't qualify for that. I mean, we obviously have money. This, they take the sick or people who need to go for treatment. But we go, he goes to the Air Force and says, hey, man, let us go here. This. And, 
And the, guy, the general says, I'm sorry. There's a purpose for this plane, and you don't qualify for it. And, and I call my uncle. My uncle says, oh, wait, we're very good friends with the mayor. So it's like, oh, yeah, you got muscle. Absolutely, I got muscle. Can you prove it? You, I mean, you got to prove it. That's what a test is for. So he says, I do. I have a letter from the mayor that says that we're welcome, that we're his guests in town. He said, if you can prove, if you can bring the letter, I'll let you on the plane. So he runs back to the airport. I mean, the plane is about to take off, grabs the letter, hops on a little motorcycle, runs back to the Air Force base and shows him the letter. There was one problem. There was one guy, the Peruvian guy who was with us. He decided to stay in the hotel and nap. So he wasn't on the list. So the guy says, everybody on this list gets on the plane. Whoever's not on this list cannot. So we tell him, hey, man, I'm so sorry. You can't make it on the plane. And so we get on the plane. We're all excited. We get to Lima. We get a phone call. Poor guy. He gets on the plane, and the gorilla attacked the bus. Now, he survived, he did okay, they stole everything from him, but he did okay. Now, let me put it to you this way. If those seven Americans, white Americans special, would have been there, they probably would have killed him. And sometimes you have to trust God's power and direction instead of the arm of the flesh. The logic is, we got the money, we'll pay for another plane ticket, we'll pay for a bus to get us through. But if we depended on the Lord God, on the arm to direct us, on the things to do, it was a simple thing, he will, get, he will guide you exactly where you need to be. And it's so important today that whatever test you're going through, you have two choices. Are you ready? You can do the arm of the flesh. You can decide what to do. You can lead and direct your own life. You can make your own decisions, or you can allow the Lord your God to lead you in the place where you need to be. Very, very crucial. For anybody who's a Christian today, I mean, that's, that's a giveaway. You have to go there. If you're not a Christian yet, God has given you an opportunity to let him get involved in your life. But you have to let him. And he does that. It is so important for us to do that because testing, testing is also a way for God to show you how big he is. It is not just to test your strength, but he wants to show you. Look at what Psalm says. Psalms 20 says this. I love this. It says, now I know. Psalm 20, verse 6 and 7, if we have it here, it says, now I know. You know why the psalmist says, now I know? Because it's been through stuff. You can't say, now I know, unless you go through it. Unless you know it. Unless you've seen it. Is that, are you with me? You say, oh, now I know. Now I know because somebody show you. Now I know because you've been in it. Now I know. He says, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Of his right hand. But the psalmist says, now I know. I've been through it and I've seen it. So now I know. Listen, if you're going through something, just wait for the answer because God's right hand will come on you and you're going to say, you're going to tell your children, your friend, your neighbor, man, now I know. Now I know because I've been in it and God got me out of it. Now I know. Now I know. And it's very important for all Christians, for all of us who decide to follow God to believe and apply this truth. Verse 7 says, some trust. Trust is very important. But some people trust in chariots and some in horses. Basically, if you were to translate it to today, some people just trust what they have, what they have in them, the power that is in them. But we will remember the name of the Lord, our God. We will remember. That day is so important. The story continues. Verse 32, sorry, uh, verse 20. Uh, Second Chronicle says, now because of this, because he's about to lose his head, he's about to lose his town, I mean, this king of a bad, bad city is about to take over everything he says, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried out to heaven. Guys, everybody who's here today, if you don't pray, you're not inviting God into your situation. You have to invite him into your situation. He knows it. He know, I know when I was younger, I was like, why do I got to tell you? You already know. But he wants you. He wants a dialogue. He wants you to know and him to know to confirm what is in his heart. And so he goes in with Isaiah and they start praying. It says, then the Lord sent an angel to cut down every mighty man of valor, leader and captain in the camp of the, in the, camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned shamefaced to his own town and then his own kids killed him. It was, it, it was a terrible thing. Verse 22, thus... The Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and guided them. I'm jumping some verses. And guided them on every side, on every side. But see, they invited the Lord. I love this because God, they didn't even, they didn't even lift a sword. God sent an angel that wiped everybody out. 
everybody out. Let me tell you something, and let me ask you. Wouldn't it be nice that in your situation, you wouldn't have to do anything? You say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to watch you do. I'm going to watch you do. That is a powerful statement. You know what you're saying? I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to let the arm of the flesh come in and solve everything I want. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God, and God desires that. He wants to prove to you that he's able to carry you, that he's able to sustain you. And Hezekiah did that. Jump to the verse 23, and it says, And many, after this victory, many brought gifts to the Lord at Jerusalem and, uh, and presents of Hezekiah, the, to Hezekiah, the king of Judah. Look at this. So that he was exalted in the sight of all nations. On the side of all, this guy became wealthy. He became so rich because God opened up uh, and destroyed the biggest army. It's like pretty much he, he defeated the bully, the biggest bully in the, in the yard, and then all the kids were giving him lunch money. Are you with me? I mean, that's pretty, that's a simple analogy, but that's really what happened. Everybody was like, man, you took away our problem, so we're going to give you stuff. That takes me to number two. Number one is that Number one is that testing determines your strength. You're going to be tested. Number two, you will be tested in your strength. You will be tested in your strength. That sounds weird, right? Let me put it to you this way. Many people think that when I'm being tested or when you're being tested is when you're weak, it's when you're fighting, it's when you're struggling. But I want you to know that you're also going to be tested when you're strong. You're also going to be trusted in the things that you are strong at. Let me put it this way. Jesus, this is Jesus. He goes, driven by the Spirit into the desert. He spends 40 days and 40 nights fasting. Then the devil shows up to tempt him. Here's what the devil says. Hey, if you're the Son of God, if you're the Son of God, which he is, and you're hungry, he doesn't say that, but that's the implication, and you're hungry, why don't you turn these stones, rocks, into bread? You know what the devil is saying? Since you have the capability, the ability to create a miracle, to feed yourself, to take the stones, make bread and feed yourself, provide for your own need, why don't you? And God says, and Jesus says, because I'm going to depend on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He could have used his strength. He could have used his superpower, his miraculous ability to create bread and supply the need. And he said, I can but I won't because I want to trust God. And that is a truth for all of us in our Christian walk, in our life, in what we do, that where we're strong, we're also going to be tested. It's not just when you're weak. In the things that you can do, God's going to test you to see if you'll depend on him. Because this is what happened to Hezekiah. I read, a man wrote this, a man named Dor, uh, wrote, loyalty can lead to fanaticism. Caution can become timidity. Freedom can become a license to do whatever you want. Confidence can become arrogance. And humility can become servility, meaning you become a servant of everybody. All these are ways in which strength can become a weakness. All these are ways. And so you're going to be tested in the areas of your life where you're strong. Not just where you're weak, but also where you're strong. And Hezekiah was a man that became super wealthy. And here's what he did. When he became rich, if you go to drop down to verse 27 of chapter 32, it says Hezekiah had very great riches and, and what? And honor. Riches and honor. I mean, this guy just became enormous because he defeated the biggest army there was at the time. And he made himself treasuries of silver, gold, everything desirable, stones and everything next. Uh, jump to verse 30. If you go down to verse 30, then it says, this same Hezekiah... Also stopped the water. He did, he created some more resources for him. I like the end. It says, Hezekiah prosper in all his what? His works. Everything he did, absolutely everything he did was going well for him. Wouldn't you want to be in that position? I know I would. I know I would. I, I don't know anybody that says, nah, passes, okay. I mean, if it stinks, my job, ah, pay me eight bucks an hour, I'm good. No one says that. You want better. You want more. You want to pro, you want advanced in life. That's your desire. Well, Zekiah did just that, but he made one fatal mistake in his strength. And that is the warning for all of us and what God wants to show is that you're going to be tested. You're going to be tested to prove how strong you are, but you're also going to be tested in the things you're strong at. See, some, um, the king of Babylon, which is the next coming 
bad kingdom because Assyria became a mess and, ba- and then Babylon became great. Um, and that's where we read all the story, the book of Daniel and all that. So Babylon starts growing. It becomes big and he sends some ambassadors and say, hey, go check out this guy named Hezekiah because he just destroyed the biggest army there was. So these guys come and Hezekiah's all, hey, welcome my brothers, of course. And it says in in, in Book of Kings that Hezekiah showed him everything. Here's my treasure. Here's my gold. Let's go here. Let's go to the basement. Here's where I keep. He was, in our language, he was showing what? She was showing off. He, he was like, yeah, man, I got it all. I destroyed that guy, and I did this. We got water. We got gold. We got silver. I'm absolutely wealthy and strong. I mean, we're doing great out here. The problem is that when the guys from Babylon went back, they told the king of Babylon. And after that, it went really bad for Judah and Israel. They were pretty much captured, taken into captivity after a, a few years of his kingdom and other kings came, and they were taken away. But here's what I like how Chronicle says this. If you go to verse, jump down to verse 31, it says, however, say however. however. You never want that said about you. You're doing good, however. Have you ever been to a job interview and you're like, man, I killed it, however, I didn't get the job. <laughs> I'm glad you did that. It was the same thing here. It was like, however, I mean, he was great and all, but however, regarding the ambassadors of the prince of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him. Now watch. In order to test him. In order to test him. In order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. Guys, God wants to be invite you into his life, but God wants to know What is really inside of you? Why are you doing what you do? Why are you following me? Remember Hezekiah was on fire, destroyed everything his father had done, brought everybody to follow God. He did everything absolutely right. He continued on. He had a few testing with his health and a few issues, but God brought him out of all of that. And later in his last days of his life, when he's strong and fortified, when he could end the grave and God could have continued, he gets prideful in his strength. And God is saying, hey, how strong are you? I want you to know that in your strength, I still want you to depend on me. I still want you to depend on me. If you can do something, I still want you to do it. I appreciate our worship team and our teaching pastors. And they don't take their gifting for granted. They just don't say, hey, I'm good at this, so I'm just going to do it. We are absolutely dependent on God to drop it in your own heart because we cannot do it. We cannot do it. God has to do it. In the same manner for you, whatever you're strong at, why don't you open the door and say, God, check my heart. Check my heart. Don't, with, don't, don't leave me. Stay with me. Here's the final word. If you didn't get anything from me tonight, if you checked out, your brain checked out, I understand you're tired. I, I get it. Happens. I want you to remember this. Are you ready? Yes. You awake? Yes. Okay. This is what I want you to remember. That testing are not just a way to see how strong you are, but they are an invitation from God so that he can show you how strong he is on your behalf. If there's anything I want you to get tonight is that, and I'll repeat it, is that a testing is not just a way for God to see how strong you are, where you're at in life, and for yourself to determine how strong I am in my own walk with God, but an invitation, an invitation that you're saying, God, come on, God is inviting you so he can show himself strong on your behalf. So do not run from your tests. Do not run. Today, if anything we can learn from this man, if anything we can learn from Hezekiah is that, that I don't want you, God doesn't want you, you don't want to run from when you're at. I don't know your tests. I don't know your health. I don't know your marriage. I don't know your job. I don't know your immigration situation. I don't know any of that. I don't, we, we live in lives. I don't know your financial situation. But I want you to know that God is not asking you to run from it. God is asking you an invitation saying, let me come in and I'm going to show you how strong I can be on your behalf. That's what he desires. That's what he desires. So today, there's two things God wants to ingrain in you. You're going to be tested, or you're going to show how strong you are. But when when you're strong, if you're strong, if you're doing good, 
then you're going to be tested in that area too. Why? Because that's going to determine how far you can go. That's going to determine, hey, can I move up from the 25-pounder to the 30-pounder? You can do that when you pass the test. I don't know if you can go any beyond 100. That's just wicked. But if you stay down here in the 25, you'll be good, okay? So remember, invite God to be part of your life and determine how strong you are. God spoke to you. Give him a hand. Let me make sure your heart is all right with God, and then we'll celebrate together and put our needs together. But before we do that, you have to have a relationship with God. See, you have to invite. Remember that verse that said, that in Zacchaeus said, hey, somebody has the arm of the flesh, but we have the Lord our God. You know what Hezekiah pretty much is saying and is saying to you tonight? Hey, you've been doing your own thing. Why don't you invite God so he can help you do his thing? That's pretty much what he's saying. And tonight, if you're saying, Pastor, I heard the message is my first time in church or, or I've never really made a commitment to God because I, I don't understand it or, or I don't know, let me explain it to you. I believe that God already spoke to you, that you want to know where you're at with God. Here's how you check. Are you ready? If you were to die tonight, your day ends. That's it. They come knocking in your heart. Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? That's the question because really eternal life is so important. We don't see it that way because we think this is all we have. This is great. I'm going to leave it. Eight. I want to be here for 80 years, 50 years. But how about a young person died at 15? How about that? They were planning to be here 80, 60 years, but didn't. See, because lifetime is not a guarantee. Death is a guarantee, but also eternal life. But you determine, you determine where you're going to spend it. You can spend it with God or you can spend it away from God. And it's so important that you decide to do it with God. Most people say, Pastor, I, I get what you're saying, but I mean, I'm a good person. So if I'm a good person, good people will go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible, in any book, in any person for being good went to heaven. I mean, it's just simply not there. Simply not there. So you say, Pastor, I, I'm gonna, I, I got you on this one. I'm not only a good person, I'm also a person who, when I was little, Pastor, I, I learned a few verses, I, I went to church, I took my catechism classes. I mean, I've done that. I've been a good person, and I've actually learned verses from the Bible. Well, let me tell you something. The Bible says that demons believe, <laughs> and they're not going even better yet, so you can understand, the devil quoted scripture to Jesus, and he's not going to heaven either. So it's not how much you know here, are you with me? It's not how much you know in your head, how much you socially know about God or Jesus. It has nothing to do with your knowledge here. It has all to do with your connection with God in your heart. It has everything to do with your heart. How can you determine that? Here's what Jesus says. He says a couple things. He says, listen, when I come again and he's coming, I better find you hot or better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. You know what Jesus is saying? Hey, if you're not in this, if you're not in this for real, if you're not in this for truth, then I don't want you with me. You know what Jesus is saying? Let's not play games. Let's not play games. Let's not play the social thing. Hey, I went to church, check it off. I went during Christmas, celebrated the birth, and I'm good. No, Jesus is saying, let's not do that. Let's not play games. Let's be wholehearted, committed for God. That's your decision. If you want to get the benefits of the arm of God in your life, you're going to have to give God all your heart or your life this very day. How do you do that? In a moment, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand right where you're at. I'm going to see your hand, and then we're going to pray together. Whoa, Pastor, uh, that's kind of embarrassing. These people don't know me. Uh, I don't want to raise my hands in public. That, that's just weird. Here's why we do it. Are you ready? Jesus says that if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, if you say, I don't want that, he's going to tell his Father, I don't want him either. The decision is yours. See, Jesus wasn't embarrassed when he went to a cross publicly and died for you. He absolutely suffered on your behalf because he loves you. So he wants to know, are you willing to make the decision for me. This is a friendly place. As a matter of fact, 90%, most of us here at some point had to do it. At some point, we had to do it. And when we did it, it was tough. But you know what? We've never regretted it. That is your decision. That's what you have to do tonight. The decision is yours. Are you ready? I'm going to count to three. You raise your hand. We'll pray together and ask Jesus to come into your heart. Who should do this prayer? If you're not with God, if you're running away from God, 
pretend that's for you. Who should do this prayer? If you know in your heart that God spoke to you and you're not right with God, don't leave this place without him. Who should do this prayer? If you did it one time when you were a kid, why don't you confirm your prayer tonight and reaffirm your commitment with God? If I describe you, you raise your hands. We'll pray together. One, two, and three. Is anyone here? Thank you. See your hand, two. Thank you. See your hand. See your hand, three. Thank you. You can lower your hands. Anyone else? Thank you, four, five. Thank you so much. You can, I see your hand. You can lower your hand. I see a hand over there also. Thank you so much. Is anyone else in the family room? Great. Two. All right. Awesome. Anyone else here? Six, seven um, people have done it. It's a little girl there. It's okay if she wants to do it. Is there anyone else here tonight? This is your decision. You're saying, God, I, I need to do this tonight. I'm giving you that opportunity. We're making the space for us so you have an encounter with God. Is there anyone else here tonight? They're showing hands, but I thank you so much. See your hand, eight. I'm giving you a chance. I'm waiting. We're ending early just so that you have an opportunity with God. Thank you so much. See that? Nine, ten, not sure where we're at. Is there anyone else? I'm waiting because I I believe the Spirit wants me to wait just a tad longer. I know it's uncomfortable silence, but we'll get over in a minute. If you're there, just raise your hand, and we'll pray together in a minute. Is there anyone else? Okay, this is what I want you to do. If you didn't raise your hand, and you should have, this also for you. In a moment, we're all going to stand. I want you to get your Bible, what you have with you, and I want you to take one more step of bravery, one more step to do something. I want to personally pray with you. One of our pastors wants to pray with you, but I want you to take one more step. Take everything you have with you. Bring your kids with you if you want and meet me right here, right now, and we're going to pray together. If that was you, if you made that decision, we're all going to stand and you come down and we'll pray together right now. Let's welcome them into the kingdom of God. If you were to do that, I invite you to do that. Thank you so much. for them. We'll wait for them. If you're up front, I want you to do something. Put a smile on your face. It's not a bad thing. Just, you're getting me excited. This is going to be good. Here's what you're going to do. In a moment, in a moment, Pastor Joel, who's over there, is a great pastor. He's my buddy. He's my friend. He's going to do something. He's going to pray with you. See, because this decision this is a step of faith, but now you have to invite Jesus in your heart through prayer. The Bible says that you're going to say it with your mouth, but you're going to believe it in your heart. And he's going to do that with you. In a moment, you know what he's going to do? He's going to offer you something. He's going to offer you an SBT, a book, completely free, but he's going to explain to you something. We, this church, these people, we want to help you stay strong in God. You know why? Because we don't want you to go back doing the same things you were doing before. You're here right now for a reason. You're saying, God, I I want to change. I want something different in my life. We want to help you with that. Let us help you with that. He's going to explain how we can do that, how we can help you remain strong in this process of life. Would you do that for me? Is that okay? So go with Pastor Joe. He'll pray with you, get you that information, and we'll be right here praying at the end. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Give him a hand. Give us some encouragement. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus 
And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.